Good evening. My name is J.K. Lee. And I'm Angie Scretta. Welcome to Ad Day. We're really excited to see all of you here. We'd like to thank the Lectures Committee, the Department of Journalism and Mass Communication, the local AAF Executive Committee, and especially the Ad Day Advisor, Professor Daniel Ng. For those of you who aren't familiar with Advertising Day, I'll give you a little brief history. Ad Day is a celebration of communications through advertising. The day is devoted to the exploration and diverse areas contributing to this profession. Professionals from fields of marketing, promotions, sales, and creative have been with us all day today to share their experience. Earlier today, we had Linda Earhart from Spiegel in Chicago give us our opening address. We also have with us in the audience now visiting professionals from Des Moines and um, different parts of Iowa who came and spoke with students on the one on the one to one level about how to get a job in advertising how to get a job in communications we encourage you to take advantage of all the opportunities that Ad Day has to offer especially next year when we hope to do Ad Day 3 we have an absolutely wonderful man to introduce to you tonight this man was born and educated in England and in 1943, he joined the Navy, where he stayed for 16 years and experienced three wars. In 1959, at the age of 32, being married and having three children, he joined the advertising agency of Crawford's in London as an account executive trainee. In 1971, a lot of people from that agency went over to the agency of McCann. In 1975, this man went to South Africa to manage the McCann operation there and then in 1980 came to the United States. In 1989, this man was named Director of Headquarter Operations for McCann Erickson Worldwide, managing over 140 operations around the world. So as you can see, when you talk about professionals, Michael Thomas is a refreshing personality. With years of British Royal Navy experience, he left it to release his bottled energy and talent in the world of advertising. When we speak of international influentials and dynamic people, Michael Thomas is it. He has great taste in selecting Iowa, to which he has never been. <laughs> we took him to the Iowa Historical Museum yesterday. He was fascinated. <laughs> He's from New York, by the way. Um, we are really happy to have him. We're glad that he decided to come upon our invitation to share his knowledge with us. And he has brought a great program to cap off a great celebration of advertising. And without further ado, we'd like to introduce, him, introduce you to him, Michael Thomas. Living up to that's not going to be easy. Um, if we can have the, the first part of this, what I have to say, will sound more like a geography lesson than a little vainglorious. Um, about McCann Erickson, the agency I work for. Um, but there is a point to it. Um, it sounds almost like a commercial for McCann, and to some extent it is. Um, but if we have the first slide, I really want to set the scene for what the global advertising is about. There's been an awful lot of sloppy talk of global advertising and people thinking you just take campaigns and put them in a brown paper envelope and send them around the world for somebody to translate and run in another country. But it's a much more sophisticated operation than that. And we now, with 1988 billings of 4.4 billion, which we're happy to say, if anybody's buying the shares of IPG, was a 28.2% increase over 1987. Um, and we are the largest ad international agency um, in the world. I think there are three other agencies who all claim the same, and I think we're all right, um, <laughs> de depending on which criteria you use. Um, we claim it by the number of markets that we cover, and one or two other arguments that I'll come to in a minute. Um, so we have a 143 agencies, 67 countries. To illustrate the internationality of the company is the only reason for this slide. We are an American company. Chairman Bob James is a C the chairman CEO is American. 
John Duna, who looks after North America, is an American. The man who looks after Latin America and the Caribbean, Jens Olesen, is a Dane. <coughs> and he's been in Latin, he's worked in Europe, um, America, and Latin America. Uh, he's been there now for about 10 years, I think, more, 12 years. Max Kuznir is a Belgian by birth, a Belgian-Russian, in fact, by birth. Looks after Asia Pacific, based in Hong Kong. And we break out a peculiar piece of geography, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand, uh, which anybody who looks at a map can see the distances of that, is run by Graham de Villiers, who is a South African. Um, Johnny Cattardo is the odd man out. He is an Italian based in his home country of Italy. And he looks after half of Europe. And Michael Ferrier is an Anglo-Dutchman based in Paris um, who looks after the other parts of Europe and Africa, and, and Africa. So it is a fairly international complex um, in terms of management. And here is where we are. This is where the geography lesson comes in, where the, where the offices are, headquarters in New York. Offices in America, mostly where the clients are. Um, New York as the headquarters. Detroit, that is where um, General Motors are. Atlanta, because Coca-Cola is there. Houston, because Exxon is there. Los Angeles, um, because Century 21 is there. San Francisco, for Wells Fargo and Del Monte. And nobody yet knows why we're in Seattle. But it, it's a very, very growing office, in fact. Washington Apples we handle out of there. And the um, four offices in Canada as well. Um, Europe, virtually complete cover. Um, number one agency in Italy, in Spain, number two or three in Germany, number four or five in London. We've gradually been expanding. The latest office <coughs> opened last year was in Budapest, uh, which is one step into, the, into Eastern Europe. We think we may be in uh, Moscow this year, or if not this year, next. So we have all these offices um, around Europe. The same for the Middle East, where they're only associates. We, it's so unstable there that nobody puts any money. Um, but we do have associate agencies there to help the clients who want to work there. Um, Africa, um, associates now only in South Africa. Our own office in Nairobi. Um, associates in Cameroon, Lagos, Abidjan, in the Ivory Coast, and Casablanca is there because one of our creative directors is rather romantic. Um, he's a great Humphrey Bogart fan, but we do in fact have an associate in Casablanca. Latin America, again, virtually complete cover. Um, the difficulty with dealing with Latin America is getting the money right. Argentina last year had an inflation rate of 1% per day. Um, and Brazil looked like a thousand percent this year. So people are actually given the day off on payday so that they can go and manipulate their money to get it right because the inflation rate is so abominable. But there's a lot of business and a lot of advertising in those markets and very sophisticated advertising too. In the Pacific, again, um, it's a race between Tokyo and New York as to which is the largest office now the largest agency, with the help of what's happened between the yen and the dollar, Tokyo is fairly large. Uh, we have got an operation in Beijing, um, associates in India, so they're out all over the world. And the billings, different from a lot of American agencies, 70% of our business is outside the USA. The light green is the business that we do outside the USA, and the dark green, the business we do inside the USA. So actually, as an American company, we've got a vested interest in a weak dollar, um, as far as the return is concerned. And outside the USA, we are the largest. We're only about number 13 in America, um, after, some, after the JWTs and Saatchi's and um, Young and Rubicons. Um, but outside the USA, we are the largest agency. We don't include Dentsu, um, the Japanese agency, 
because no one can work out how they calculate their figures. <laughs> and then again, in cover throughout the world, we're in 67 countries, BBDO, Ogilvy, 50, 47, and so it goes on down. Rank in the top three agencies, 25 countries, top 10 in 44, deeper roots than any competition, over 20 years experience, 45 countries. And that's how long we've been in some of them. So it isn't a recent phenomenon um, of going international and looking after international clients. We've been doing it for over 60 years and gradually building the, the network. And the other important thing from our point of view when looking after these multinational clients is to have control over the subsidiaries. If Exxon or Coca-Cola or UPS say we want you to handle our business worldwide, unless we actually control our agencies, we can't guarantee that we will do so and we can't guarantee the quality control. So we do believe in wherever we can, and there are some countries where it's just not legally possible, in having control of our own agencies. <coughs> but here really comes, and this is the first of two slides, because you couldn't get them all onto one, um, <coughs> of some of the multinational accounts that we do handle throughout the world with the year, however long we've been handling them, and the number of countries where we look after them now. There are two points really to be made that not all um, big multinational accounts are necessarily American. Um, Nestle are Swiss, Unilever Anglo-Dutch, Martini and Rossi, um, Italian. Um, and also the way that our system has worked over the years. In some cases, one tends to think, well, okay, you land an account in America, and they say, whoopee, we'd love you to do uh, advertising all over the world. Yes, that does happen in some cases, not very many. Um, we've been associated with Coca-Cola since 1942, but the first place we ever handled Coca-Cola was in Brazil. And it went from Brazil to Argentina to Mexico to Europe, and was 14 years before we handled any Coca-Cola business in America. Um, with General Motors, the first place we handled any General Motors business was in 1930 in Germany. And that was 26 years later before we handled any General Motors business in the States. So sometimes it starts from the States and goes out to the rest of the world. In other cases, we gradually build up association with these companies and back into the States um, to fill the hand, as it were. Um, the funny figures on the, in brackets on the right against Goodyear and Nabisco are the years when we first had any association with them. And then in Goodyear's case, 32 years later, they actually aligned with us everywhere in the world except in the home country. We do not handle their business in the States or Canada, actually. Um, but we handle it everywhere else in the world. And that is their choice. They like to keep it. Um, separate. Um, and again, among this list, there are German companies, French country, companies, Jap Japanese, by miles is now German, um, used to be handled out of Elkhart, is now handled out of Leberhus Leberkusen um, in Germany. Um, so really the question is how, in a global sense, does one handle these clients? And the short answer is that there's no one way of doing it. Um, we've devised, I hope it isn't too complicated a chart. Can, it, can you see it at all from the back? Any idea? Um, what we call the continuum of global marketing. Now, it's probably not very easy to read, but a lot of these clients are what we call decentralized global products. They go into an individual country, the local management have control over what they do. Um, it's very autonomous in each country who advertises what products and how and what agency they use. 
There are, as one moves over towards the right, there are some that have a universal product positioning that they want to give a universal character to the product throughout the world, but still leave a lot of the local work to the local agencies. Then there are some that have a universal brand positioning. There's a bit of a subtle difference there. There's the difference between product and brand, because product is a motor car, brand is whether you call it Opal, Chevrolet, or uh, that virtually the same in Australia, GM cars are Holden. In Germany, they're called Opal. In other countries, they're called by different brand names. And then way over on the right, the very few what can be called global brands that are virtually exactly the same, with the same name, the same approach, the same character, the same culture in any country in which they are advertised. And there are comparatively few of those because there are comparatively few products that are absolutely <coughs> appropriate with exactly the same positioning in a lot of different markets. Um, something like Coca-Cola, yes, is a drink, is a refreshing drink. You can project it in exactly the same way in every country. It satisfies the same needs. Camel cigarettes. Uh, a cigarette is a cigarette. Um, so you can project it with the same character across different cultural um, barriers. But with something like um, or as um, Nestle, Nescafe, the different ways that, c that coffee is drunk and instant coffee is drunk and regarded in different countries is very, very different. So what we have to do is try and work out a way of taking account of the culture of the client and the culture, the character of the product and make it appropriate to the culture of the country in which you're trying to sell it and where it is appropriate. And to do that, you have to have an awful lot of input from the individual countries. You cannot just play this brown paper envelope game. Um, and it's this reconciliation, this sensitivity to where the product fits in a different country um, that is really the name of the game. So we have to have people who are sensitive to this kind of thing. We have, in fact, for some of the clients, a very separate creative group in New York called International Team, which largely looks after Coca-Cola, but quite a lot of other clients as well. Um, where the head of international team is a Brazilian, in fact, who speaks five languages I fluently. Um, his number two is an American. The chief art director is an Englishman. Um, we've got a Japanese. I think there are seven nationalities at the moment in international team who work as one creative group. And they periodically call in the creative directors from all over the world and sit down and say, what is going to be appropriate for Coca-Cola? Um, and everybody has an input. Because the other negative of trying to do the thing centrally, if I am sitting in London, as I did once, um, and people come along and say, these terribly clever fellows in New York have devised this campaign. All you have to do is translate it out of American into English, and you can run it in England. My immediate reaction is negative, to say, what the hell do you know about England? How are they so wise in New York um, to tell me how this should be handled in England? But if you've brought in the people from all over the world, listened to them, had their inputs, um, then you get an amalgam of all the ideas and you can come up with the idea, well, this may not be, this may be a good idea for most of the world, but perhaps not for England, or perhaps not for Japan. 
So Japan can go off and do its own thing, England does its own thing, or the others slightly adapt a basic strategic idea. And it comes back to a point that the speaker this morning was making, that you'd better have a very, very strong strategic idea in the first place before you start doing the creative work. Because if the idea of what you're trying to do is not strong, it'll break when you try to adapt it or tinker with it a little bit or adjust it for an individual market. Now, what I've done to illustrate the point is bring some tapes with me of how this has been applied in practice. Um, Coca-Cola is <coughs> excuse me, probably the most global of all. Um, so there was a commercial, if everybody remembers Hilltop from years and years ago, he's probably too young to remember Hilltop, I think, a fairly famous Coke commercial. Um, this is, in effect, son of Hilltop, which ran all, all over the world, except, oddly enough, in the States. And as a sort of glorification of, it was done at the time of Glasnost and Peace and um, a glorification of Coke's place in, in, in the world. 26 different versions of it were made in 26 different languages um, to run in different parts of the world. And if I may, I'll just show you the first three commercials on, on this tape. With first is the basic. If we can kill the side first, and then it won't anyway. um, This was the basic commercial, the first one. I am the future of the world. I am the hope of my nation. I am tomorrow's people. I am the new inspiration. And we've got a song to sing to you. We've got a message to bring to you. Please have the beat for you and for me. And tomorrow, tomorrow, if we are Japanese, only the beginning and the ending were in Japanese. <laughs> This is the amalgam of all of them. I am the future of the world. Je suis l'espoir de ma nation. Je suis l'espoir de ma nation. Et je suis l'espoir de ma nation. Recently, a gathering of young people from all over the world took place. They celebrated in song the many things they share in common. A hope for a better tomorrow. Friendship that goes beyond language. This is a message of hope from Coca-Cola. 
stop it then. Sorry. Even within that, there are all sorts of peculiarities of doing because there was a straight Spanish version, a straight Spanish, uh, French version, a straight Portuguese. I don't know whether you notice it. The Japanese, you had to have a man and a girl um, for some cultural reason. It wasn't, they wouldn't accept just a girl singing it. Um, the Koreans, you had to have three. Um, and I still don't quite understand why. You had the white girl and the black girl both singing in Zulu for South, for, for South Africa. Um, so there are all sorts of subtleties that still have to go into a commercial of that kind. Now, the same kind of thing applies if that is a broad corporate um, kind of commercial. There are the harder edged um, trying to sell the idea of Coke and food. The Coke is the appropriate food to have whenever you have a snack. But a snack in Ames is probably a burger or a bag of fries or I don't know. Um, in Malaysia, it is not. Um, in Australia, it can be something different. But the idea that Coke is appropriate to whatever the food is appropriate in a different country <coughs> still remains absolutely solid. Um, but what foods you actually show, you vary a little bit. And there are three commercials here. You have to look at them quite closely, actually, to see where the foods change. Um, but there's the one basic Coke and food idea, and then two adaptations for two other countries. So can we see the next three? have to take into account other technicalities like different packaging in different countries some don't have the two-liter bottle some have more cans some have a slightly different design bottle and that sort of thing all that has to be taken into account but the basic idea is absolutely clean simply adapted and of course the one thing that does help us enormously um, these days is music is virtually um, global you can use the same music practically anywhere, an, anywhere in the world. Now, another example, um, Goodyear, Goodyear Tires. Um, they came to us saying, well, we are a great big global agency, handle all our business all over the world, but not the States. Um, and we want one campaign to run throughout the world. We scratched around at this for a bit, and they said, well, wait a minute, you haven't got one tire that you sell all around the world. In one country, it's Eagle. In another country, it's called something else. In another country, it's called something else. In another, it's Vector, and they're all totally different. Um, that, so then the answer was, well, focus on um, 
the all-weather car, which will work in snow, sleet, rain, hot weather, cold weather. So we thought, that's going to go down terribly well in Morocco, where they don't have too much snow and you don't sell the tar anyway. Um, so we still had to try and work out a thought, a concept, that could be applied to whatever, uh, could be appropriate at least, to whatever tires were being sold in those countries. And it got quite considerably adapted on the way. The line that came up was Goodyear take me home, the underlying thought being that everybody wants to be safe on, on, on their tires. But there are all sorts of different subtle ways of playing that same concept in different markets. And there are three commercials here that illustrate that, one from the Philippines, one from England, and the other from Peru. So I think it's Peru. <laughs> British are a bit more understated. That was a great holiday, wasn't it? Mm, we needed a break. Mm. It's nice being by ourselves, too. Yeah. But there are other products I mentioned before, Nestle, different co coffee cultures, different appreciations of when coffee should be drunk, when it is appropriate, where to try and force down one idea in every market would be um, really rather silly. Uh, so there, they virtually go market by market, what will be appropriate for Nestle in each market. And so you'll see absolutely no similarity between um, these campaigns for Nes uh, Nescafe whatsoever. So can we see that the, the, the uh, there are two campaigns from two different countries and the last three commercials are actually quite interesting because they're, they're, all, they're all from England but they've, it's a rather new idea that they've done of turning commercials into a mini um, soap. Um, they're 30 second soaps. But you'll see what I mean when you see the commercials. Hmm? I think there are five. It's, it's to the end of the reel anyway. So. Necessarily, 
Thank you, Wes. <laughs> Believe it or not, it's Japan. Do you believe that's Japan? Hello. Look, I'm sorry to bother you, but I don't need a dinner party and I ran out of coffee. <laughs> Come in. Thank you. Will girl wouldn't be too good for your guests. Oh, I think they could get used to it. It's a very sophisticated coffee. They have very sophisticated taste. Do they? Yes. Well, I must be getting back. Now, golden roasted, richer, smoother, Nescafe Gold Blend. Have you met your new neighbor yet? Oh, I've uh, popped in for coffee. Okay, so there are some quite different approaches to selling Ness Cafe, but I hope it gives you some sort of an idea of, of the variety and some of the intricacies that have to go into uh, developing campaigns for different markets. Makes it all, I find, rather exciting and interesting. Uh, you have to have the right kind of people who have traveled around quite a bit to hold these accounts together. I'll be happy afterwards to answer any questions you've got. Incidentally, going back to the Nescafe, that one, the Japanese one, might have surprised some people. The reason is that in Japan, coffee is only now becoming the accepted, sophisticated drink and they like to see it put in a European context. So we did do a campaign called Windows on the World, which took everybody through Paris and Italy and God knows where, showing coffee being drunk, rather than just showing it being drunk by Japanese in Japan. Um, I have got another tape here, um, and this is a straight international tape um, simply out of interest, because if you're in the advertising course uh, or involved with advertising, hopefully you'll be interested just, just to see some commercials from all over the world. 
uh, with possibly one or two places you wouldn't expect to see the commercials from. There's another Nescafe commercial from um, People's Republic of China, which is a bit surprising. There's a commercial from Hungary. Um, and if you can stop before the last two commercials, because they're a repeat of the Nestle ones, um, I'll tell you when to stop. It's the last Coke commercial you stop. I'll, I'll cue you, don't worry. Um, so just take a little trip around the world of advertising. For those of you who know JK, you will realize this commercial was made especially for him. <laughs> Well, I think you have to tell me, and believe me, you're saying, love it. 
Last year we put one and a half million buyers and sellers together. One home at a time. It's perfect. I do hope he comes with the house. Century 21, the largest real estate organization in the world.